Good morning. The June 26, 2023 meeting of the Economic Opportunity Review Committee is hereby called to order. We welcome our committee and all participating via, via teams. Please be advised that all that who are participating via teams will be muted with the exception of the committee. We also welcome our guest speakers and members of the public watching on Xfinity Channel 64 and Fios Channel 40. EORC members include Deputy Commerce Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, who is the chair of this committee, presidents from the African American and Hispanic Chambers of Commerce, as well as representatives from District Council 47 and District Council 33. At this time, I will ask the members of the EORC from the African American and Hispanic Chambers of Commerce and the District Council 47 and 33 to introduce themselves in that order. Good morning. My name is Regina Hairston, President and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce for Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Rodriguez, President and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Good morning. I'm Robert Harris, Vice President and Legislative Director of AFSCME District Council 47. And the representative from District Council 33 is not present at this time. My name is Lynn Newsom. I am the Deputy Commerce Director for the Office of Economic Opportunity under the Commerce, De Commerce Department. I will give in, I'll begin by giving those of you not familiar with the history of the meeting a brief overview of the purpose. The EORC was established by City Council in March of 2012. The committee is responsible for the following to oversee and facilitate a public review of the implementation, effectiveness, and enforcement of Chapter 17-1600 entitled Economic Opportunity Plans. To take public testimony related to diversity and inclusion in the, cities, in the city and being responsive to that testimony, and to share information that is relevant and useful to the development of MBE, WB, DSB firms seeking to do business with the City of Philadelphia and to make recommendations to the City Council for the adoption of resolutions calling for the appropriate remedial and legal remedies where we see flagrant violations to inclusion and commitments made by contractors to co subcontractors on city contracts. These meetings are held on a quarterly basis, March, June, September, and December, and today in trans groups of today's and all previous meetings are available online at OEO website, which can be found at phila.gov forward slash OEO. Anyone that is interested in giving testimony at the next scheduled meeting, which will be held Monday, September 11th, 2023 at 10 a.m., must call 215-683-2057 or send an email to Ariana dot d dot four at phila.gov by 3 p.m. the day before the meeting and submit the following information. Your full name, a callback number, an email address where you can be reached. If the above information is submitted within the required time frame, those that have registered to testify at the meeting will be telephoned during the meeting invited to a remote meeting. They will be given additional instructions by the committee chair once they are connected. At this time, we would normally have the public hearing portion of the meeting, allowing the public an opportunity to give testimony. Seeing that there is no one here for public testimony, we will move on to our guest speakers. Our speakers today will be Salim Wilson, Senior Director, City of Philadelphia Commerce Department's Commercial Quarter Improvement and Business Services, to talk about the broad Germantown Erie projects efforts related to diversity and inclusion, as well as other information helpful to the MWD SBE community. The second speaker will be Nakisha Bailey from Win Win Coffee, Philadelphia's first woman led coffee roaster, distributor, and co roasting facil training facility. And Gregory J. Allen, Overbrook West Neighbors of, Nober of Nober Overbrook West Neighbors to talk about the physical improvement and enhanced corner, um, enhanced commerce that his organization has made to the upper Lancaster Avenue business quarter between 52nd Street and 63rd Street. 
and plans for that area, including community investment, as well as what is needed to make, a, make that vision happen. With that, we'll start with our first speaker, Celine. Good morning. Um, my name is Celine Wilson. I'm the Senior Director for Commercial Corridor Improvements and Business Service for the Philadelphia Department of Commerce. Um, I want to thank the, the committee uh, for inviting me to speak specifically about the Broad Germantown and Airy Streetscape project. Um, and to start, I just kind of want to give you an overview of what's happening out there um, and what we're doing, who the project partners are, um, the cost and um, the ranges that was actually set. So, of course, the Broad Germantown and Airy Streetscape project was a priority for the current administration. Um, the Streetscape project um, was created to improve traffic and safety on Broad Street, which is considered a high injury network. Um, to create easy connections between Area Avenue and bus stops to improve old trolley tracks to make Area Avenue even safer for the community and the commuters passing through. Um, we're building uh, new bus lanes, bus shelters, bike lanes, sidewalks, green spaces at the intersection of Broad Germantown and Area. Um, the city goal is to increase traffic safety, improve set the bus service, and beautify the intersection. Uh, these improvements will help support Broad Germantown and area as an iconic transit hub and shopping center of North Philadelphia area. The current project is funded by city capital budget, PennDOT's automated, auto, automated red light Enf enforcement program, which is the Arley grant, and the PA Department of Community Economic Development Multimodal Transportation Fund, which is also known as the DCED grant. Some of the specific components um, include sidewalk and street trees, crosswalk with shorter pedestrian crossings, um, a median in the middle of Broad Street, um, which uh, uh, will allow uh, traffic, um, our commuters to cross the street safely, uh, green space at Broad and Butler with seating area, lawn plants, uh, new lighting and trees, a transit plaza at Broad and Airy with an elevator to the Broad Street line station to be constructed by SEPTA, of course, new bus shelters, bus only lanes and sidewalk level bicycle lanes on Erie Avenue, um, sidewalk adjacent bus platforms on Erie Avenue, um, of course, removing the old trolley tracks, bicycle racks and trash cans, gas, gas main replacement on Erie Avenue um, and public art. Uh, the proposed improvements will reflect recommendations made by the City Planning Commissioner on the 2035 Upper North District Plan, which identifies this intersection as a focus area and the proposed pedestrian safety improvements and streetscape improvements to support the revitalization of, of the important transit node and commercial centers. This is also, there's also a percentage of art, uh, which will include a more iconic gateway feature and a 3D sculpture, a 3D sculptural element on Erie Avenue. Um, the project has been through a successful bidding process. Um, the lowest bid came in at $7,271,579. Um, and the MWBE, MBE ranges was 15 to 17%, and the w, WBE ranges was 11 to 12%. Um, the, 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 the contract has been awarded to Ramos Construction. Um, and is scheduled to begin July 2023. This project for me has been um, a long time, a long time coming. I mean, I think we're we're in the in in the in one of the areas where we haven't seen a whole lot of uh, uh, city investment. Um, fortunately enough, we are glad that we on Area Avenue making these improvements. But you know, a lot of things you know we look at. Um, we look at total opportunity fund for minority inclusion. And, you know, there were some things happening where the city tried to do um, some some footwork to try to get minority contractors uh, involved in this uh, project, um, which for me um, came with uh, a lot of barriers itself. Um, we, the city planned an event with the Black Contractors Coalition, Coalition um, with Call to Serve, which is one of our um, CDC partners and Otis, to hold an event um, for prime contractors that uh, that that construct these projects and public works. Um, I think that the idea of it was a great idea. I think that the the um, the purpose of 
the the uh, event was to pair prime contractors that work in the public space with minority contractors who were not uh, educated to this process of working in heavy highway um, and working in public's work, which is a totally different thing than building trade contractors. Um, but the problem that we have is that the problem that we had is that the, the uh, prime contractors did not show up. So we had, you know, we had PIDC there, myself, Commerce, OEO, of course, was there to talk specifically about um, the city's programs, but the idea of the event did not go as we expected it, which is um, a problem um, in itself because they rely on this project. We have um, we have a M we have an MBE um, contractor working on a project, but we have no minority subs working um, in. We have a woman, excuse me, we have a woman um, certified contractor, but we have no specific minority black and brown um, subs or black and brown um, minority range, minority contractors working on this specific uh, project. So there in lies, there's an issue there with the with the program in itself, because these, um, for, unfortunately, these um, projects are um, kind of specialized and I like building trades. There's some education need need to happen around it. And I think this was the idea of this event to give um, to put the minority contractors uh, in contact with the public work contractors to try to create uh, to make an uh, introduction and try to create some connections where they can actually learn how to put these uh, put these projects together. Um, Another barrier that I see is that OEO's knowledge of the project um, should they should get notification well in advance, at least to notify the contractors, the MBWE, the MWBE contractors that work in the space to kind of make an ad adequate uh, suggestion. You know, a lot of times the projects come out, um, the bid happens, and then the then the process kind of it, it flows through a certain level of uh, departments, a certain area of department, and some information that we receive um, at Commerce and at OEO um, doesn't allow for an adequate time to find specific minority contractors that can actually work on the case, work on the contract. Um, another area um, that I specifically see is an issue is that the prime contractors will do what they call a good faith effort in obtaining MWBE contractors, meaning if they don't specifically look hard enough, if they don't um, happen to find someone, they can say, hey, I made a good faith effort. Uh, here's what I found, but I'm going another in a different direction. And the city has no, um, we have no control or no jurisdiction to, to say whether or not it's, this works or not. Um, so overall, I think that the this is a good project because the area is an area that had hasn't had an investment in a while and the area needs it this is a traffic uh, um a, a heavily trafficked area a heavily used a uh, transit area so these um improvements are well uh needed um and we are actually still excited that it's happening um but i think we have a whole lot of work to do we're trying to put minority um, contractors educate them in this space and get them working on these projects, not only as um, um, MBEWE certified contractors, but prime contractors to be able to bid these projects themselves. So thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be um, happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, for your presentation. Um, I will put it to the committee. Do you have any questions for Mr. Wilson? Good morning. I have a few questions. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, for your presentation. Uh, I want to start with a clarifying question. Uh, you noted that there's 15 to 16 percent MBE participation. Can you give us the breakdown of what that representation looks like? Um, so I don't have the contract in front of me. Um, I didn't. I, I have the total amount um, of the, the the contract itself, but the percentages were set. Um, by OEO, um, and is this a specific contract? But I can get that information to you um, once this. Uh, I can send it to Lynn, and Lynn can forward it to you. 
Certainly, that would be quite helpful. Um, and I noticed that you said there was an event with the Black Contractors Coalition to sort of help spread information or educate the uh, subcontractors. Is that correct? So the event was specifically set up to um, connect prime contractors that work in the public space with minority Black minority contractors. Um, the event was was supposed to uh, introduce a lot of the larger public work contractors to the minority contractors working, um, um, minority certified contractors and the Black Contractors Coalition uh, to get them to um, work, to, to at least meet. And then, you know, the idea was to try to get them to work together in some on some of these public work projects. Certainly. So I guess I'm trying to understand the it seems like there's no incentive or sort of uh, repercussion for not participating if you are the prime contractor. And I noticed uh, you spoke about there's no real uh, the city has no real um, way of uh, challenging this good faith effort made by the prime contractors. Um, can you speak to that just a little bit for me? Um, absolutely. So you're, you're absolutely right. There is no way. And it's basically it, it basically speaks. It is what it is. Right. We the city can't doesn't have the the jurisdiction or the the power to say, hey, you need to be there. They um the streets department will doesn't think that it's uh, um, productive to force uh, contractors to come. Um, the, the prime contractors to come to these events. Um, but one thing that we, you know, we kind of discuss um, in, in, in our calls is to try to uh, set up um, a on job type training uh, a situation where we can um, identify some minority contractors to kind of go in this public workspace in this public workspace with the actual contract that that's happening. But we are not um, in a position to make any one of the prime contractors come to these events. Um, and, you know, that's one of the barriers that that's one of the issues and the barriers that we're having right now. OK, thank you for that. But just for a point of clarification, not to force them to come to the events, but in this whole good faith effort, I would assume not having the contract in front of me. Um, is there something written in the RFP language around this good faith effort? And if so, who has the ju uh, jurisdiction to enforce that? I think, Regina, I can answer that. Um, OEO does has the authority to to um, and we do monitor the good faith efforts. So they have to um, prove to OEO that they made a good uh, faith effort before we OK, you know, the, um, their their MBEW numbers. And we do have, you know, a procedure that we go through to assure that there is a good faith effort made and it has to be documented by every contract. OK, so there is there is jurisdiction on the good faith. Yes. Yes. OK, no, great. That's that's what I just wanted to uh, clarify. So so can I make I, I want to clarify what I meant in, in regards to the good faith and in, in regards to um, jurisdiction and having contractors come to these events to try to make uh, a connection and introduction uh, to the minority contract. So the contractors. So that's kind of what what I was referring to. I apologize. Yeah, I, I I understood. I just wanted to make sure somewhere, not necessarily the event, but somewhere in the yeah, RFP, someone has jurisdiction to say mm -hmm. there is uh, a good faith effort that must be shown. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. And uh, that's the only questions that I had around this presentation. Thank you. Okay, I do have a question for Mr. Wilson. In your opinion, what should happen moving forward? You spoke about um, contractors not showing up to to the event, and um, what can the city do to ensure that um, contractors both know about the event and uh, what would bring them out to uh, such event event in the future? Um, so for me, I think in in the actual uh, language of of the contractor and the RFP um, that actually goes out to. Uh, it goes out to the uh, prime contractors. There should be some language around um, including or presenting um, 
minority contractors with the ability to join them um, in and uh, and and what what we like to call here at Commerce um, uh, um, um, uh, on the job training. Right. Um, there needs to be some language and the, there needs to be some language in the RFPs. And when the RFP is accepted, you know, we 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 have to be more uh, uh, intentional about um, giving instruction or being. Um, being firm and saying this is what we're expecting from you if we're putting these dollars up for this contract. Um, there are a lot of barriers with procurement and and how things move in in the space. Uh, um, when we when we in the public works con um, when we in the public works space, so it's, it gets really difficult when you talk about language and contracts and how you move forward with moving a contract a specific way because it's been going this way for so long. And um, I think you know for me with you know what, working with uh, OEO and working with different people on this specific project. Um, there has to be some intentional changes on the on, at, at a level where people it's their job to make sure that these contractors um, operate in the, the, the OEO space in regards to the certification, and then also including minority contractors and and showing how and showing them how this works in the public and showing them how to work in the public space. So you mentioned you mentioned that in these um, particular uh, in this particular project there were some um, trades that you know there was not a lot of minority uh, or women contractors and so what you're saying if I'm hearing you correctly is in an RFP this type when you we can um, anticipate that there is not a lot of uh, availability for minorities and women that there should be some language that the prime contractor trains a minority or woman to you know in this sort of like a, an apprenticeship is that what i'm hearing or yes. some some type of program like that that yes. would ensure that there would be some type of representation for our minorities and women yes okay thank you anybody else have any questions from the yes. committee yes um so thank you for your testimony. I do have an observation and and a a question. So the observation is you mentioned that you had partnered with uh, at seeking to provide opportunities to black contractors. I might remind you that the my MBE category includes also Hispanics and Asians and their organizations that can help you um, make contact with those groups as well. So um as we want to be inclusive in the city of philadelphia mm -hmm. do be mindful that there are other organizations and groups that should be included in the outreach um secondly um there's this question about good faith efforts and i wonder if there is a clause in the rfp that defines good faith efforts and that perhaps there it should be strengthened or explain to include something along the lines of participation in outreach matchmaking efforts uh, and that that will be part of the assessment or determination whether a prime has actually engaged in good faith you of course you know i think the law department will tell you you can't force primes and general contractors to participate. But one thing you can do is you can outline what a good faith effort is and includes, and you can tell them, and you will, when we make a determination, you know, your participation in these government sponsors, commerce department sponsored activities related to this project will be counted so that when the time comes and they say, well, we tried and we didn't get, you can say, well, no, you did not try because you did not participate in this matchmaking or this outreach effort um, as defined uh, in the good faith clause or something along those lines. Thank so that's you. just Thank a message. You. Thank you. Um Jennifer, we uh, we do have a definition of good faith effort. And um to your point, we can make sure that you know moving forward, you know, we, we talk to Kermit um department to make sure that that criteria is listed in our all RFP so that people know contractors know from the beginning what a good faith effort is so that you know if they do 
not fulfilled, they, they already know that they did not go and then they can go down that checklist. So, you know, that, that recommendation is, is duly noted. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Wilson? Thank you again, Mr. Wilson. And we'll move on to our, our second speaker, Ms. Ms. Bailey. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Nikisha Bailey. CEO and co-founder of Woodman Coffee, Philadelphia's first black woman-led coffee roaster, distributor, and co-roasting training facility. Also on the call is Matthew Nam, um, my co-founder of Win Win, and we're very excited to be here and tell you about our business and just speak about some of the experiences we've had as a black-owned and women-owned woman-owned business in Philadelphia. Uh, so Matt and I uh, started Win Win in 2019. Uh, we were a brick-and-mortar location located on Spring Garden. We were voted one of the best new coffee shops in Philadelphia off the bat for both him and I. Uh, it was one of the first coffee enterprises that we entered into, but quickly had to shut our doors because of the pandemic. So throughout the pandemic, we were thinking of other ways we could still you know, generate income. We had built a very strong brand and we began researching what it would actually take to insert ourselves into the coffee supply chain. So not only be a coffee shop, but be able to roast and provide coffee to others. During that time, uh, we launched our initial roast. We did it with a co-roaster because we didn't have the equipment yet ourselves. And it actually ended up being the best-selling roast for their co-roaster. Uh, and we decided that this was something that we wanted to get into because we were very successful. And we began launching to build our own roasting facility uh, and acquiring the, equip the equipment such as a large commercial roaster, packaging equipment, and being able to have the necessary network to actually obtain and import the coffee ourselves. Um, and that's when we launched Win Win Coffee. Uh, we currently have uh, a new location coming in Kensington, located in the Jasper House, which is a new development in which the ground floor is reserved for minority owned businesses. Throughout this, it's a bit about a process of two years of uh, finding a location, scaling our coffee business. We've had, we have had hit, hit a couple of roadblocks as a you know, minority owned business in the city, uh, one being access to capital, one being net, you know, access to certain networks and certain procurement teams. Uh, the farther along we went into the process uh, is when we learned of you know, the actual uh, different organizations that were present in the city that could help uh, introduce us, provide resources. So that was definitely an experience that we kind of learned as, you, as we went along. So we are members of the Afro uh, African American Chamber. Um, we participate heavily with the Urban League. Um, we're also um, members of the Hispanic Chamber as well. And so being able to utilize those different resources has been instrumental in terms of meeting uh, procurement people, uh, meeting you know banking officials, what could be provide access to capital. Uh, for the past two years, Matt and I have bootstrapped Win Win, and we've been able to you know have enough revenue in which we can scale our business, but it hasn't been uh, easy because we didn't have business history to qualify for a bank loan. And you know, we both had to put up our personal finances to really get the business off the ground, uh, which you know, for us, I feel like might be a unique case because we have been able to scale and grow large partnerships with uh, companies such as PayPal, such as Warner Music Group through our previous relationships. But really our next focus is really penetrating Philadelphia because it is full of large anchor institutions uh, that we could have our coffee in and really trying to obtain those contracts with those in institutions as well as with the city, because those are the type of situations that can create generational wealth. Um, we've also, you know, our business model is a little different because we do work directly with the farmers. Uh, we have a vertically integrated supply chain, so we are able to pay the farmers a little bit more. Uh, farmer coffee is a $500 billion industry. It's the second highest traded commodity in the world after oil, which I don't think people realize how big of an industry it actually is, but farmers see the less revenue uh, in this, this massive industry. So we work hard to make sure that the farms that we work with directly uh, do receive a living wage. Our supply chain is diaspora centric. So a black hand touches every part of supply chain from seed to cup. We also um, work closely with PowerCore uh, in terms of hiring and training the next generation of coffee professionals to show people that you can go beyond having a shop if you want to and actually 
be a real participant in the industry by owning parts of the supply chain. Um, we, our coffee coffees are featured from African countries, so we have blends right now from Ghana, from Rwanda, uh, from Tanzania, and from um, Ethiopia. We are working closely with the Colombian government who has reached out to us because they've seen the success we've had with our African blends that we're working with Afro-Colombian farmers uh, directly to highlight roasts from that region. Um, I think, you know, our, the next step and what um, we are working toward again is establishing those relationships uh, with procurement people, knowing that, you know, there is a little bit of a barrier to entry for us because we haven't been doing this very long, even though we've been very successful. So in terms of competing with uh, larger organizations who've been providing coffee for decades to these companies, um, you know, it, it's, it would be great to, to know that companies are actually uh, have intention behind their words. Yes, you want a minority supplier. Yes, you want a woman owned supplier. But what are you actually doing to bring that into your institution outside of doing the procurement meetings. We do the follow-ups, but what are the actual concrete steps into getting my coffee into Drexel, into UPenn, into Jefferson Health, which we've been having the conversations and they are moving forward, but it would be great to, you know, if these institutions had actual like deadlines and, and you know, were actually in, intentional in seeking out, bringing these businesses into their organizations. And I think that that is about it. Our coffee is currently available online um, at winwin.coffee. Our new location launches in the fall of 2023 in Kensington at the Jasper House. And again, I want to thank you guys uh, for having Matthew and myself in the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you for speaking with us. Matthew, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, uh, nothing for me. I think Nikisha covered everything uh, perfectly. Um, thank you so much for having us all. Um, and we're really excited to be a part of the Philadelphia, um, you know, the Philadelphia business community and, to, to, you know, to hire Philadelphians and to really be, you know, part of the local, the local, a local business that's consistently growing and really being true to our ethos. Thank you. Uh, now I'll open up for questioning from the committee. I do have a question, and so Nat, Matt, and Nikisha, it's great to see you once again. Um, what um, if you could? What does Philadelphia need to prioritize in order to support small businesses like yours? Like, if you had, if you said, if the city would would improve this three things it would create a better place for us in which to thrive i would say i would like to see more intentionality with um bring onboarding minority owned businesses so whether that's a set amount of the budget whether there has to be someone that does checks and balances to make sure that budget's actually being allocated to minority owned business, I would say would be number one. Two, I would say, I feel like there has to be a little bit of head hunting done because I think, you know, I have the luxury of being able to work on my business instead of in my business, which I didn't have that early on. Like as a small business owner, you're constantly, you're managing a team, you have to have capital in order to grow your team. And I, I think the city can, maybe do a little bit more of head hunting of actually seeking out businesses and know they might have to do a little bit more handholding to get them to those next steps, just knowing the, the barriers that they have already coming into being a business owner. And three, obviously access to capital. Um, in order to scale a business, you need money, you need uh, access to loans, you know, and just knowing that minority owned businesses don't always have a track record of having a business or, or um, having that history that banks want to see or having enough income generated that banks want to see but being able to stage gate those different levels of criteria to make it a more level playing field for minority owned businesses and as a follow-up i have a couple of questions so you are using language that um you know working 
you know, on your business rather than in your business. Have you ha, have you participated in any capacity building or technical assistance type of programming um, to get you to this point? Yes. So uh, we are graduates of the Goldman Sachs 10K SB program. Uh, we've gone through the Santander Cultivate Small Business program. Okay. We've done Aramark um, Diverse Supplier program. And I think that's it. We've also and won so, a few pitch competitions too, which yeah. I also know is a luxury, being able yeah. to actually map out and plan out and have time to do things. But, you know, I think, um, again, that's something that I think if, if minority owned businesses had the support and being able to be able to spend this extra time to build their business, like that would be extremely beneficial, you know, beyond words. Yeah. So when you talk about onboarding and uh, allocations, do you, do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, what do you mean by that? So, so I understand the allocations. Does that mean making sure that there's a budget light item that prioritizes small business? There is, there's a budget line item that's uh, prior towards a small business. Uh, they're intentional with it. There are checklists that might be a little bit more, like I said, you might have to do a little bit more hand holding with the small business to ensure that they can actually do it. Because again, it's it's new language, it's a new opportunity, but it is an opportunity to scale and just being you know cognizant that some businesses are going to step up to the plate, but some aren't. But you, as a, a large institution who wants to commit those dollars to, minority owned businesses and small businesses, you have to know it's going to come with trial and error and be okay with that. I'd love to piggyback off of what Nikisha said. Um, I think also creating some type of funneling system where there's a pipeline, because uh, I think stage gating is really the, the core focus of this because businesses are at different stages of their life cycle. So if we stage gate them, put them through a funnel and watch them through this pipeline, you achieve this, you uh, you get to the next stage, you achieve this, you get to the next stage. And maybe at, towards the end is um, possible capital or an opportunity to support an anchor institution or um, just to, to work with, a, to, you know, to have the to have the ability to work to get one of the contracts that uh, would be very, very difficult for a small enterprise to enter into. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Ms. Bella, you spoke about the vertical chain. Could you could you provide a little bit more detail of, of what that exactly is or what that means? Yes. So one of the, the biggest reason why farmers earn less is because there are so many middlemen um, in terms of moving coffee. Every time the coffee moves, it loses its value, but it allows the buyer on the other end to to have a huge markup and so we're able to source because we have direct relationships with the farmers and different international governments uh, we're able to import uh, roast grind and distribute all through our supply chain and that that makes you able to to do what to 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 uh allow the farmers to earn a, a higher wage, but also we control every aspect of it or we're connected to every aspect of it. So um, we're able to get the coffee a little bit faster because we have been able to build this network and supply chain. And we're also able to get mass quantities of it for the bulk buyers. Okay. Does that translate to a cheaper product for the consumers or it, just, it benefits you know, mainly the farmers that you it benefits the farmers. We are able to do be competitive with larger distributors, but we also want to, you know, people to pay the value for the coffee and knowing that they're actually their dollars are going into an all diaspora centric supply chain and they're having a d direct effect on the farmer. And knowing that, you know, for a lot of these art, large institutions that that you know talk about DNI efforts, it's important to their teams to be able to showcase and show that they actually are putting their money where their mouth is. So we also have we have higher price points, but we're also able to to give them competitive uh, pricing up with other coffee distributors. That's your name win win. So it's, it's a win for the, the win -win. supplier and a win for the consumer. Absolutely. OK. Anybody else on the committee have a question? OK, I thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Our next presenter is Gregory Allen.
from what Overbrook West neighbors, Mr. Allen. Thank you, um, Chair and committee members. I do have a question for Ms. Bailey, but I'll let you see my presentation and then we'll talk about my question. So, um, I think I'm sharing the wrong. We see, yeah, we, we do see your screen. And, and I, can I remind everybody that's not speaking to put yourself on mute, please? I'm hearing a little background noise. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mr. So, Allen? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Proceed. Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, we are Overbrook West Neighbors. Um, we're a um, new community development corporation serving the Overbrook neighborhood of West Philadelphia. Um, and that is the business corridor from 52nd Street to 63rd Street on Lancaster Avenue. And so, um, um, our mission is to keep Overbrook safe, clean, and organized. Um, we work with our um, community stakeholders um, and do anything we can um, to improve the quality of life in our community, including serving as the RCO um, and managing and managing the business corridor. So this is our, our mission and vision. I'm going to run through some of these a little faster um, so I can get to the corridor specifically. Um, these are the things I mentioned that we do. Um, during COVID, um, since we started in 2019 and 18, in 2020, um, we pretty much ceased a lot of the work we were doing on the corridor and focused on COVID-19 um, support relief um, for business owners. We, we helped with PPE and to get them um, grants and, and to clean up. Um, and then we return to what we do now, which um, has a lot to do with the quality of life in the community as well as um, the business corridor, because we want to ensure um, that the community is prepared for a corridor that is um, clean and safe. And so this Mr. is the Allen, Mr. Allen, I think we're having trouble with, with your slides. They're not advancing. Okay. We just see you know, a, a beautiful shot of a, a piece of land and, and water around it. Got it. So, how do I escape from that? So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to start sharing again. Um, Nope. <sighs> is this a PowerPoint presentation? It is a video. Okay. So I was going to say I could help with a PowerPoint, but if it's a video, I'm my hands are, are tied. I, that's not my area of expertise. Anybody else on here that may be able to? If, if you don't mind, Chairwoman, being an avid user of Teams, when you go to the share button, um, there will give you options of what you want to share. You can check if you're highlighting what specific item, and that's what you want to make sure that that item is highlighted in order to share that. Okay. So it's saying desktop. You you want to choose the it should have different screens there where you can choose different options and it, it'll give you the option to highlight web page, desktop. It's only it, giving it, me the option of desktop. Without seeing your computer, I, that might be where my help ends. <laughs> 
Okay. Let's see if I can close it and reopen it. If that works. Nope, same thing. Okay, so let's see if... Well, we did get some kind of movement. I think we're back to where there's like little islands and with the water surrounded. Can you advance from there? Um... No, oh, ma'am. I see it's sharing. Yeah, we can see your, your presentation. You can now? We can see it, yes, but we can't see, you know, it hasn't advanced itself, so. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, it's okay, we have plenty of time, so just take your time and we'll, we'll get it figured out. Mm -hmm. It's only giving me the desktop as an option. So while you're figuring that out, we I did have a question in the chat about um, uh, Miss Miss Bailey. Um, the question is, where is the the Jasper House, and what is your website? I'll put the website in the chat. The Jasper House is in Kensington at 825 East Boston. So okay. it's a brand new development that's it's going to be 100 residential units. And then the ground floor is for uh, industrial or commercial businesses, which I think only two are filled. So I know our developer was still looking for minority owned businesses who could take the, the additional spaces. But I'll put links to both in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Still no success, Ms. Harrison. Um. As I've opened it. Well, Lynn, I, I think that perhaps Mr. Allen can just just, you know, tell us a story. I think video just enhances rather than tell the story itself. I think we can we should be able to move without it. And, yeah, and and yeah, as express. long as you can see it, Mr. Allen, as long as you can see it, and you can speak off your slides, then that'll probably work until, you know, I know you have a a um, drone presentation that we all wanted to see, but maybe, you know, you can figure that it out as you speak about your organization and what you have done in that quarter. Okay. Um, so Lancaster Avenue um, is from 52nd to 63rd um, with um, support of um, a team of folks from Overbook. We have managed to um, provide a um, enhanced corridor. Um, Commerce Department early on gave us support for a um, master plan that helped us to um, provide fiscal enhancements to the corridor. Um, and so we've been working off of that plan for some time now. Um, in the five years we've uh, been around, we have um, had enhanced lighting, LED lighting. We have um, had the corridor paved. We've provided some signage. Um, with the corridor safety grant, we have um, done quite a bit um, of um, improvements to small business owners, with small business owners to um, other um, elements of the corridor. Um, most recently, uh, we have established the Overbrook Night Market in a, a partnership with our state representative, Morgan Cephas. Um, and that has been a real um, effort to attract positive attention to the corridor, um, some 10 to 15,000 people join us every spring um, 
42 food trucks, um, um, DJs, Family Zone, all in an effort to um, make the corridor more attractive. Um, and this year, uh, a, a large percentage of the people who join us for the night market are um, black, brown, and minority um, business enterprises, particularly women. Um, our efforts moving forward are um, with the support of a number of different government and foundation um, sources, we intend to uh, improve the storefront, storefronts of some of the businesses along um, the 6200 block of Lancaster and the 1900 block of North 63rd Street. Um, with um, hopefully receiving other funding from uh, Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. We've been working on renovating a few properties, one for our office space that we hope to move into later this year. Um, we have done quite a bit in helping the other um, entities on the corridor. One, we, we have the um, blessing as well as the challenge of having two major public works projects on our corridor. One is um, Overbrook High School uh, and one is Tustin Playground, both of which are historic um, public facilities. So we've been working very hard with um, those two entities to try to ensure that they are um, stable and growing and, and maintained. Um, at the 56th Street um, side of the corridor, there's a, a plaza called the Overbrook Plaza that has been um, restored thanks to our council member, Curtis Jones. Um, and there we have quite a few new um, Black-owned businesses, one of the most popular ones um, in Philadelphia, particularly West Philadelphia, called Blue Brook, um, a very uh, well-known music and food establishment. Um, there's a new uh, food establishment called um, Crafties and a third uh, barbecue place called Dibs. So up and down the corridor, there are opportunities for growth and development, which is one of the things I think I'd like to talk to Ms. Bailey about. We'd love to have a win-win coffee in Overbrook um, because our, our purpose has been to ensure that Overbrook um, is a, a place where small, black, brown, minority um, enterprise businesses can find a place to grow, develop, and thrive. And so we've done that um, at different locations. Uh, at 50, at 62nd Street, there are two new business um, entities happening. One is a commercial development, uh, which is going to be five stories um, of housing with commercial properties on the lower level. And then um, next to it, uh, of a long term business. Overbrook Environmental Education Center is building um, a pharmacy, F-A-R-M, pharmacy that will provide fresh fruit, fresh foods, fruit and vegetables to our community. Um, Overbrook is home to two transportation hubs, uh, the Malvern Trolley Loop, which is at 62nd and Malvern, um, and that has been cited by SEPTA is one is three of the top 10 transportation routes come through that trolley loop every every day the g bus the 10 trolley and the 46. so um about less than a half a mile away is the overbrook train station which is um home to the largest the, the um, most traveled regional rail line um, the Paley Thorndale um, and another development um, that's in fact 
interested in having a coffee house um, uh, in, in, at Sherwood and in, in 63rd, home to 111 units. Um, and um, that type of development, mixed use development, is happening all around Overbrook. Um, our goal is to ensure that it's equitable for our business owners and that it doesn't neg negatively impact on the quality of life for our neighbors. Um, we began our work with our focus on the mantra of the Commerce Department, which was safe, clean, and lit. And we continue to make an attempt to keep that going, um, ensuring that uh, our corridor, our community is safe, um, working with the streets department and the police department to ensure that it's free of um, any kind of debris or abandoned autos or tractor trailers. And again, we had it lit with the um, support of um, the streets department, the new LED lighting. So it's a really uh, a, a beautiful place for new investment. We hope to, we, we intend to apply for additional funding from DCED um, next month in the form of a RACP grant. Um, we've been talking to Commerce about the storefront improvement program and other ways to make our corridor um, a place that people would want to invest. Um, and um, if there's any opportunities for investment, for matching funding for the RACP or for anything else that people would be interested in, I'd be interested in having those conversations with folks. I'm really sorry I'm not able to show you my video because I worked really, really hard on it, but I'll send it to Ms. Newsom. Perhaps it can be posted somewhere and you can take a look at the corridor from 30,000 feet. It's really a nice place to do business for small black and brown and minority businesses. And with Thank that, you. I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Allen, and, and I'll be happy to receive that video. Looking forward to seeing it. I was part of the tour of your quarter with um, Councilman Jones and very um, impressed that the, by the work that you have done. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the impact it has on you know, revitalizing that quarter and the impact it has on the people that live there? And that's the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, why would people want to come to West Philly? And what have you done to, to bring people in? And, what what would make us want to come to West Philly now? So, um, I've, I refer to our corridor as the gateway between Philadelphia and the main line, which is actually what it is. We're less than a half a mile from the, the county line from City Avenue. And the impact of investment on our corridor is to um, prevent all that vert from leaving the city and going into the county. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other is that our neighbors, many of whom, um, Overbrook is known as a middle neighborhood, and many of our neighbors are low income, which doesn't, uh, which sometimes means fixed income that didn't keep pace with um, inflation. And so they need places within walking distance around the community um, where they can um, shop and do business. Our corridor has largely been an industrial corridor. Um, about 60% of it right now is um, taken up by 15 businesses that are auto related. And so we're, we're working on taking some of the properties that are vacant and turning them into commercial properties so that we can kind of change that mix a little bit of commercial um, industrial. Um, we have about, uh, in, the, in the latest DVRPC, Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission vehicle counts, I think somewhere near 12,000 commuters travel our corridor daily. 
um, in both directions. So there's clearly a very um, positive commuter um, for a cup of coffee um, to, uh, or for anything else, to drive and, and grab something for, for a small grocery store, for anything that um, folks would want to bring. So there, there's definitely um, the uh, need for those businesses and there's definitely the value to those businesses in the, in the form of pedestrian and commuter traffic. And what does revitalizing that area do for the um, the safety? And you know, ha what impact has it had on you know um, maybe eliminating or a reducing crime? The you know the more an area is built up, and the more you know people have to do, and the income that comes in there, and the opportunities. What ha what impact have you seen um, crime wise? So I'm a believer in broken windows theory. It, it's been used in ways that were not intended by its authors. But clearly, if you find some facility, a warehouse, this is what the authors believe that have broken windows and those windows don't get repaired, then another window is broken and another one. And then it becomes a negative use of that facility. Instead, we've been repairing those windows. And so people have seen positive ways to benefit from our community. So the more improvements we make, the more investment that comes um, to our um, public facilities, to attracting places like Blue Brook, to attracting you know, um, other commercial investment, the more investment we make in making the, the corridor safe and clean, the, the better our opportunities for attracting commercial investment. Thank you, Mr. Helm. I'll put the questions to, to the rest of the committee. You have any questions for Mr. Helm? I don't have a question. I just have a comment. That was a great uh, overview of the work that's being done and in your corridor. So thank you for that. I think after listening to Ms. Bailey um, and listening to all the effort and the work that's been driven out of the West Philadelphia area, there's an opportunity for us to work even closer together. Um, there is there's a lot of resources that do go towards small businesses, but I think the navigation process is still sort of convoluted. And I think we could do a better job uh, getting that information out. The diverse chambers, we do a survey twice a year. I think it would be helpful, Mr. Allen, uh, to have you participate as well as the other corridor managers and helping us get that out because I think we really need to focus on um, we know the resources are there, but if the end user doesn't know the resources are there, then they don't exist. Um, and so we have to work together to do that. There are a lot of initiatives that come out of the Commerce Department that people just don't know about. There are a lot of initiatives that comes from each of the chambers that people just don't know about. So that means we have some more work to do. So I look forward uh, to partnering with you even more closely for us to do a, a more targeted or intentional way of getting the information to the small business owners in a way that that they can access it because access doesn't exist if you don't know it exists. Ms. Harrison, thank you so much. Our corridor is home to about 100 businesses um, from 52nd to 63rd. Um, and many of them are longtime business owners, some 50 years plus. Many of them are brand new. And so the level of knowledge and expertise for somebody that's been in business for 50 years is very different from someone who's been in business for two or three. And and I wanna kind of highlight something, Ms. Bailey, and, and I'm sorry, her partner, I know his last name is Namaste because I love that. Um, and so um, in COVID, one of the things we discovered 
was that the back of the house was probably the most challenging component for new business owners. So it sounds to me like Win Win Coffee has got that covered, but there are a lot of folks who could really benefit from that. Um, Our elected officials made every effort to distribute COVID funding to lots of businesses that were not able to receive it because maybe some of their back of the house support was needed needed some help. So we would love to partner with you to help them with that and to help promote our corridor. One of the things we've asked the Commerce Department for is for some support to, to let people know that there is a Overbrook Upper Lancaster Avenue business corridor. You don't have to do everything in some of the other corridors. You can shop right here at home. I think that was one of the biggest purposes for the Overbrook night market because we wanted people to know that you can come right outside in your own neighborhood and shop and have a good time and patronize black, brown, minority, women-owned businesses and feel safe and not have to go five, ten miles away from home. So we welcome the opportunity to do that with you, Ms. Hairston. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Ms. Rodriguez or Mr. Harris, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions for me, but uh, being a resident of Overbrook and I have seen um, the night markets um, there in last last few when I was not able to come, but I'm definitely interested in attending in the future. I look forward to uh, meeting you there. See you next May. Yes, sir. Don't make me have to come and get you. I know <laughs> we neighbors, so, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Okay, so that's it for our speakers today. I would like to, to thank all our speakers and add the following comments. As both the chair of this committee and as, as well as the deputy commerce director for the Office of Economic Opportunity, we continue to look for innovative ways to increase MBEWE, DSB, and DBE participation in the city of Philadelphia con contracts. Therefore, I invite the MBE, WB, DSB, DB community to utilize the workshops and information sessions that OEO provides every third and fourth Wednesday of the month from 1 to 3 p.m. In addition, I strongly urge our BIPOC community to attend these meetings, the, these EORC meetings. They play an important role in providing information and an opportunity to share what is relevant and useful to the development of MBEWB, DSB, and DBE firms seeking to do business with the city. And they also provide us an opportunity to hear what's going on out there. So we need to know what's going out there. As always, I remain grateful for the opportunity to lead this charge. And if there are no further questions, comments, or suggestions, I would like to adjourn this meeting and thank you for your attendance. See you in September, if not sooner. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a safe, happy summer.